Melbourne's train network has 222 stations, and to mark 200 vlogs of reviewing such stations, I'll be selecting my top 10. The criteria? I'll be selecting based on my opinion of aesthetic, so there's no formal criteria, but you will notice that the selected stations often have elements of excellent design and nice surrounding views. I'm also only including stations operated by metro trains, than V-Line stations or other heritage railway stations, which might technically be in Melbourne or close to it. I'm Melbourne Railway Videos, and this is the top 10 Melbourne train stations. At number 10, we have Brighton Beach Station on the Sandringham Line. It makes the list purely for being right at the bay, something that its creators must have realised when they simply named it Beach at its opening. While from a user perspective the station isn't the best, with a somewhat confusing walk up to it and of course its characteristic sharp curve, it serves as a pleasant gateway to the base side. It even has some nice heritage buildings to add to the aesthetic. A fun fact about Brighton is it's actually got this third platform that's fenced off here. This is platform one and it's not currently in use despite having all the station signs, like this one up here saying Brighton Beach and one. There were plans to reopen this as part of the Metro Tunnel project, but I don't think that's gonna happen now because they've cut the budgets. So a lot of the network wide improvements aren't gonna happen, unfortunately. Maintaining the sea theme, we've moved across to the other side of the bay to Sea Home, which is at number 9. Sea Home is also very much defined by its curved platform, but I like it for its peacefulness. It may not have actual views of the sea, but it does have this calm feeling to it, nestled into suburbia and this stretch of parkland. Sea Home was actually the fourth least used station on the Melbourne train network, excluding Stony Point and Flemington Racecourse lines, of course, so it's no wonder it feels so sleepy. You can tell why Sea Home is one of the least used stations. I was the only one to get off here, and it looks like I'm going to be the only one to get back on as well. The next station is so good that the band Toto made a song all about it. Well, that's unlikely to be true, especially as Rosanna had its, or should I say her, glow up probably 30 years after said song. Rosanna is certainly worthy of artistic celebration, another success story of the Level Crossing removal program. Its design is colourful and pleasantly stands out among the local community. Also impressive is the use of greenery to help the station feel connected to the surrounds, even if it is a landmark. Up next is an example of another type of level crossing removal strategy used, the trench. While trench stations are often unimpressive concrete ditches, Heatherdale is a beneficiary of its location in the hills, with pleasant views of the nearby Dandenongs, allowing it to not all be underground. Another thing I love about this station is its use of the colour blue and its Lego block-like shelters leading up to the concourse. Like many trench stations, it has passenger facilities in its concourse, which doubles as the entrance and exit. Heatherdale might have been closer to one if it wasn't for the nearby Eastern Freeway and all these power lines, but it's still a terrific station for Melburnians to enjoy. Moving further down the Belgrove branch, we find ourselves at Tacoma, the only station on the list which I haven't been to until now. Although it's perhaps the last station you'd want to be at during the fire season, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory why, it is one of the most serene stations on the network, I reckon. Um, if there is ever to be serenity at a train station, you can actually smell it when you get off the mountain smell. It's very nice. Like Sea Home earlier on in the list, this piece is afforded by it being one of the least used stations. Tacoma is the second least used station, again excluding the racecourse and Stony Point lines, on the network, with only the Hurstbridge lines Wattle Glen having fewer annual passengers. 
It used to actually be on the railway line today known as Puffing Billy, back when it was an experimental timbered narrow gauge line, but it got amalgamated into the Metropolitan Broad Gauge Network in the 1950s after the narrow gauge line closed. Now the penultimate station on the Belgrave line, it's like a teaser to the Puffing Billy adventure that it waits at Belgrave. Far away from the hills and back in the suburbs, we find ourselves at number five on the list. Coburg was once a plain, you could even say tacky station on the upfield line, aside from of course its nice station building. Surprisingly, up until 1995 it only had one platform, despite being in a busy shopping area and serving a pretty extensive suburb. Its new look is perhaps not to everyone's taste, but I love it. I think the entrance is most impressive with its large Coburg sign, as well as the generous area underneath the platform where the base of the stairs are. Just like other Skyrail stations, they have also incorporated a very useful walking and cycling path underneath, as well as other community facilities nearby. There are other stations on the upfield line which could really do with an upgrade like this. Next up is one of Melbourne's newest stations. Opened in 2018 as part of the extension of the South Morang line to Mernda, Hawkstow provides great views of the surrounding hills and Plenty Gorge Park. Many know this, but there used to actually be a train line running through where the station is now, up until the 50s, en route to Whittlesea. The line was cut back to Layla. As far as I'm aware though, there was never an actual station where Hawkstow is now, although there were many rail motor stopping places along the line, which were like bus stops. Thankfully, repeated extensions to Epping, South Morang, and now Mernda have seen a fair chunk of the line be restored, allowing us to enjoy this spectacular new station. The level crossing removal project has provided us with some wonderful new stations all across Melbourne, but Carnegie was one of the first stations built under the Skyrail method. Coming in at number three on my list, I could have picked Carnegie, Murrumbina or Hughesdale because they're all basically the same station, so sorry if you love the latter two. Carnegie offers a flashy user experience with its modern elevated platforms and its glamorous shelter. But it's what's underneath which is, in my opinion, the best part about it. With all the formerly wasted space that has now been opened up, they have put the Jaring Walking and Cycling Trail which goes from Yarraman to Caulfield. They've also put numerous other community facilities such as basketball courts and dog walking parks. It is a very innovative station and has been the prototype for Skyrail stations all over Melbourne. Now we're at the business end. Flinders Street Station is very unlucky not to be at number one on this list. It is Melbourne's most famous, most used and probably most useful station. Its recently restored Edwardian building is perhaps even Melbourne's biggest attraction. Through Flinders Street's 12 platforms, although confusingly they're numbered up to 13 and there used to even be a platform 14, it acts as the biggest interchange in Melbourne, with every single metropolitan train line except the Stony Point line stopping at this station. It has very convenient connections to Federation Square, the Swanson Street trams and shops and the Elizabeth Street trams and shops. It also links up with the Yarra River, you might know this new entrance at platform 10, and even Melbourne's famous laneways with its DeGrave Street exit although this is currently closed for Metro Tunnel Works. It will also soon connect to the new Town Hall station, which will be open in about two years from the time this video was filmed, if all goes to plan. But edging out Flinders Street Station at number one on the list is Carum, which will be no surprise to regular viewers of my channel. Carum offers spectacular views of Port Phillip Bay with its elevated vantage point perfect for viewing the sunset. It's a spot nice enough to spend the afternoon to take in the amazing scenery. When it was rebuilt, the government also upgraded the surrounding area, ensuring a better connection to the beach and its victory in the marginal seat that includes Carum, of course. It really beautifies the trip down to the often maligned Frankston Terminus, and I wish they rebuilt more stations like it along the line rather than bow into political pressures to build trenches. In any case, that was my top 10 stations as of the upload date of this video, but this list will no doubt change as great new stations open. 
the Metro Tunnel is set to bring some amazing new stations in and around Melbourne CBD. I've already had the pleasure of visiting Arden Station and it looks great. Of course, as the level crossing removal project goes on, it will continue to deliver great new stations. I'm looking forward to seeing the new Glen Huntley and Pakenham stations, whose designs already look spectacular. The new Union Station will also be interesting to see, which is going to replace Mon Albert and Surrey Hill stations on the Belgrave and Lilydale lines. Please let me know which stations you thought I should have included in this list in the comments. It was hard to choose just 10, leaving out stations like Stony Point, Glenroy, Bond Beach and the new Preston and Bell stations. So that brings me to the end of the video. Thanks to all my subscribers for your support for the channel over 200 vlogs and I look forward to making many, many more. It's great having an excuse to explore Melbourne's rail network and of course the many other networks I've been on. I'll see you in the next video.